want to say good morning to everyone. I think sometimes suffering can be voluntary. And the reason I say that is you come and listen to me every week. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the Lord's Supper. We're going to focus on a call to suffering. And that Lord's Supper is less than two weeks away. And uh, the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, if we were to look at that, uh, just focus on that period of time and uh, take a look at how Jesus was trying to speak to the disciples, to give them this idea of what was going to take place. He's trying to get them to grasp the situation that was going to happen. And of course, the disciples couldn't take this. They, they couldn't understand. In fact, uh, Jesus himself says in John I can only tell you certain things because sorrow is filling your heart. You can only take so much, and I understand that. Uh, he wanted to get them to understand that he needed them. When you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, he asks Peter, James, and John, come along with me, and the rest of you pray here. And, and he was asking, I guess, his, his close inner group, come and pray with me for a little while because this is hard. And what's amazing for me is he's got full conversation with God. There's no limits there. So he's got that avenue to be able to talk to God and he's going to be in prayer, deep, intense prayer. And yet he asks for his friends to be there. You come and share with me because this is going to be hard. And I'm thinking that's amazing that instead of just going spiritually to his father, he asks his friends to be involved in this time of suffering that uh, he is going to have to endure. And it started that evening. It went all the way through the night. Uh, we would say probably Jesus didn't even sleep that night. He's going from one place to the next, one trial to the next. And then finally in the morning he goes to see the Roman governor and goes through that trial there. So he had a very long night ahead of him. He was asking God for help. Uh, and we know the enemy was going to hit him with everything he had. He wanted to make him fall, and he was, there was no holds barred, of course, with our enemy. And if we look to Jesus' life, though, uh, we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. We're going to see that Jesus was called, that was his mandate for his life to suffer. He was not going to have a carefree, easy existence uh, if we're looking at reality at all in that sense, you think the devil was going to wait until, okay, now I can start to tempt him. No. He was going to be after him all the time when he could. So he's called to a life of suffering. We, we see that uh, he had joyful times too, uh, helping to heal people and, and uh, seeing people walk for the first time and seeing people come to God. Those were joyful times, but he was also going to be in a, a time of trial. If we go to John 1, and verse 11, let's start there. John, the first chapter, and verse 11. We're going to see that Jesus' life was going to be a challenge from the moment, uh, if we would look at it that way, when uh, Joseph and Mary have to flee with Jesus to go into Egypt because his life was in danger there. Uh, Right on through. It says in verse 11, John 1, verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. That's given me the idea they were going to reject Him. Uh, and if we were to look at that, even His own family were going to reject Him. Remember, there was that one instance they were going to go up to the feast and they were asking Jesus, their brother, I think the, his brothers were, are you going up to the feast at this time? No, I'm not going to go. You go ahead. Well, if you're this dynamic miracle worker, don't you want to go there and be seen by everybody? So you get the idea. They're very cynical of him. And that's his own family. So he had a, a very hard issue to deal with where... Uh, even at the one time he is, he is teaching uh, the disciples and whoever else was, was with him at that time. And the brothers, and I think his mother were outside, wanted to talk to him. And he says, well, who are my brothers and my mother? And he points to the people and says, you are, you're my family. So we see Jesus was going to suffer 
maybe even an emotional sense that anyone who is rejected, there's going to be hurt there. And Jesus was going to suffer physical, but I think he was also going to go through hard times emotionally. Let's go to Isaiah 52 and go with verse 14. There are other areas now. Uh, Isaiah 52, verse 14. He's preparing these last 24 hours for uh, uh, enormous, enormous physical torture, enormous physical beatings. In verse 14, it says, Isaiah 52, As many were astonished at you, your visage or your, your, your complexion or your face, your facial appearance was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. He was going to go through, uh, well, in Canada we'd say you're going to be beat to a pulp. And I'm sure that's kind of the idea. He, the devil wasn't going to let him get away scot-free. He was going to take this last chance. He was going to give him everything he had. And let's go over to the next chapter, Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 8. Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 8. A lot of us recognize this time uh, of year we kind of turn to these scriptures but he was wounded for our and you know what wounded also means tormented for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities nothing he'd done but for our sake the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed and that reminds him right away we think of the passion uh, you know, I think, for the most part, Christianity did not understand the, the extent of the beatings he was going to go through. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord, or the Heavenly Father, hath laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. Didn't he have people, almost daily people come and say, well, you're, you're a devil. Because no one can do these works except you're, you're of the devil. you got the power of the devil. Accuse him of being a deceiver. They laid on the, and he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Verse 7, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And let's go also to Matthew, the 27th chapter. Matthew 27. Verses 27 to 31. Matthew 27. 27 to 31. Now here, it's not only his people and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin that are coming and uh, wanting to beat him, but we also have other people involved in well. Then the soldiers, these are the Roman soldiers of the governor. So we're not talking about the temple guards. They already beat him up already once. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had pitted, uh, plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. And a reed in his right hand, of course, they're mocking him as the king. And they bowed the knee before him, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe from off him and put his own raiment on him and they led him away to crucify him. And brethren, we need to re realize uh, suffering is not something we like to put forward. Uh, remember how it was said to the Jews and to the Greeks how it was, this was not going to make sense to them why a king was going to come and have to suffer the way he did. Because every time we look at a king, we think of this glorious uh, person, arrayed in royalty, no one can get him, but this is a king who is going to suffer. Uh, we don't like suffering. Uh, let me just bring this up. Last night, I thought I was smart. I went to the mailbox to put some mail in there, and uh, 
on the way back, I, I walked through the, 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 well, I know shoes. I thought it's warm enough. I felt it was. Being a Canadian, you feel that's warm. And then I walked and I got back in and I got a sliver. So my wife loves those occasions when she can get the needle out. And she has this wonderful smile when she comes to you with the needle. Now I'm just joking, but she tried and so did Josiah. They both gave it their, you know, they were mining in that foot and could not get that sliver out. I'm still kind of working with that today. But it, it reminded me that there are types of suffering that are not going to go away. Paul was speaking about, he had a problem, he, he, some people think it's with his eyes. He sought the Lord three times to take that away. And what did Jesus say? My what? In times of suffering, God sometimes uh, uh, takes that suffering away from us. And there are sometimes he asks us to go through a time of suffering. Why? Because Paul will point right back and say, just as Jesus suffered, he calls us to a time of suffering. And as the Christian faith, we don't talk about that too much. Why? Because when you say to a new person who's coming to Jesus Christ, and we're looking forward to the time you're going to suffer. Let me tell you about that. Do we do that? We stay away from that. Oh, we think about the pie in the sky. How beautiful it's going to be. You've come to Jesus. There's only joy and happiness all the days of your life. That's a wrong gospel. We are told that just as he suffered, we are also going to suffer. There is no uh, immunity to something along that line. So let's go and take a look at that. Let's go to Luke, the ninth chapter. And Jesus is going to invite us to a life of suffering. You remember how it says in one, in one place, if you lose your life for my sake, you're going to gain that life. If you're going to allow me to take your life and use it for honor and glory, you're going to be receiving eternal life. We've got this idea behind it that there are times when God calls his people to suffer and yes, even die for him. It's been out oh, throughout all the church age. There have been people gone through it. So Luke 9, verses 18 to 24. Luke 9, verses 18 to 24. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah. Others, one of the old prophets, has risen again. And he said, But whom do you say that I am? Peter answered, and said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised again the third day. We know he's going to suffer. But then he makes a statement in verse 23, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What is he saying? A cross signifies what? Suffering. Verse 24, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Jesus was not hiding the fact, especially he said to Peter later on, remember in John 21, John, there's going to come a time in your life when people are going to take you and do something with you you don't want them to do. Paul was told. And, and then Peter says later on in the second epistle, he says, the Lord has shown me my time has come. He knew he was going to have to suffer. The Lord revealed that. Paul knew that he is, his life was going to be a sacrifice. It was going to be offered to God. Uh, we have to realize, brethren, that being a Christian is not a free ticket to happiness and joy on the superhighway home to the kingdom. There's going to be days when we're going to have to go through great trials. And you know, brethren, and I thought about that too, and I've mentioned that, I think, here before. There was sometimes that being in a church, I mean, in, in, a, in a, a grocery store, and you'd hear people say Jesus Christ as, as a curse word. Or they would say God, and then they'd use the next part after that. And, and the thought came to me, you know, we need to speak up on his behalf. Because Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, 
And he says, then I'm going to be ashamed of you. There is a time and there is a call to suffer. And we need to realize in our, our 21st century America economic culture that we have, we're not called to this easy lifestyle. We're called to a time where we have to be his testimony to people. And sometimes we're going to have to allow people to say what they want and, and to be rejected of men just like he was. Aren't we told in the scripture we're supposed to walk as he walked? We need to do that, brethren. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. And I'm not trying to say, well, that means all we're called to is suffering. There are times of great joy. But brethren, we cannot uh, look over the fact or go past the fact that we are called to lay down our lives if that's the case. 1 Peter 2 verses 19 to 25. And I don't want to get anyone scared because I believe the grace of God is good enough just like it had in Fox's Book of Martyrs when Nero had all these believers lined up, nailed to these uh, crosses up there and they'd pour wax on them and slowly burn them to death. I believe, and you read in there that the people were singing praises to God while they were dying. Why? Because the grace of God is greater than any trial we're going to go through. If we feel like we're going through it alone, we're listening to the wrong person. The enemy wants us to feel, you're going to be alone, you're going to hurt, and it's going to hurt forever. I don't believe that. Because Jesus said to his disciples, I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Who gave Jesus the strength to go through that? Well, we'd say himself. But you know, I think the Father was there with him, suffering with him as he did. 1 Peter 2, 19 to 25. And brethren, that's what gives me that hope. The Father is not going to leave us to the devil's own uh, evil ways. He's going to help us. He's going to be with us and deliver us. 1 Peter 2, 19 to 25. For this is a thankworthy thing. If any man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when we are buffeted, or you're buffeted, for your faults, you take it patiently. But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. We don't like that part. We like the other part idea. Yeah, if I did something wrong and I'm going to receive a spanking like when I was young or whatever, you, you, you can get a tongue lashing just as good. But he says, for doing well. Well, this is different. For even here and too were you called. We're called to what? What does he say? Suffering. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We're going to have to suffer. You know, uh, we get this idea, well, if a man is truly a godly man and walking with God and he's righteous in all his ways, he ought not get sick. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Because I look at Elisha in the Old Testament who died from a sickness. And yet God is still working through his life. So when you look at people nowadays, people get cancer or something. Saying, well, maybe he wasn't walking as close to God as we thought. He got sick. Do you think that the devil wants to get us sick? Sure he does. He wants to make us suffer as much as he could. For what glory is it if when you're buffeted, you're buffeted for your own mistakes? We go to verse 21 now. For even here and too are you called because Christ also suffered. So we've got that idea. Now verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Would we have done like Jesus had done? When these guys had come and started hitting him, he could have said with a word and they were done. You remember? Who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. What happened immediately? In the Greek we understand they forcefully fell to the ground because Jesus says, I have the power to stop this if I want to. And he could have. But the Son of God allowed them to hurt him. How many of us, if we have a son or a grandchild and someone's going to take them up and beat them up, would we watch and say, well, we would be in there stomping on that person as quick as we could. And yet here is God looking at his son, going to go through all that. 
How could God stand by and watch that to happen? And yet it was God's perfect plan that Jesus should pay the sin of the world and what a price it was. We could never have paid that price. That just touches my heart that he loved us so. That for every whip he was going to take on his back, he was thinking of you and I. And when they finally nailed him to the cross, he was thinking of us. I'm doing this for you. And I remember when I was in Dover, Oklahoma, and there was one minister who got on a bunch of us young kids because we were fooling around the back, and I fell under condemnation. And then God started working in my life while he was preaching. And then I went up, and what broke my heart that day was I could see in my mind's eye them hammering the nail into his, his hand. And he was looking at me while they were doing that. And that broke my heart to realize he paid a price for me. He was looking at me when they were doing this. Wanting to suffer for me. To take my penalty, to take my sin, so that I could receive his righteousness. What an awesome God we do have. And who sent his son, he asked his son. Do you realize there's another place in the scripture where Jesus says, God has given me the choice that if I don't want to do this, I don't have to do this. He didn't have to. I mean, he did it because of his love for us. Verse 25. For we were all the sheep going astray, but are now returned into the, ship, the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Why are we like that? Because he opened that way. He took what was mine, and he gave me what was his. And that is an awesome thought, brethren. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget the price that he paid for us. And that's why I like the Lord's Supper, because we need to be reminded of what he did for us. On the cross, in and before the cross. So I want to point, take three points. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do the first three points. Uh, was John 11th, that was number one, but uh, the first point was that he was going to be rejected. The second point, he was going to suffer. And the third point, which we just went through, he invites us to suffer with him. So the first point, he was going to be rejected. And then point number two, he's going to suffer. And then number three, he calls us to walk with him. So now the final three points, I'm going to give you these here. And they are number one, God breaks us. When I thought you were talking about a God who loves me and he cares for me. God breaks us. He takes, so I'd like you to go to 2 Corinthians 1. We're going to read three verses out of there. 2 Corinthians 1. We're going to read 8, 9, and 10. But we're going to start with the first point. And that is in verse 8. But we'll go to here. God, when he, uh, one man put it this way. If God is going to use you for his honor and glory, he's going to break you first. I don't like to hear that kind of thought. But he does. And there's a reason why he has to break us. When I had that sliver in my foot, and I still do, I'd like to have it resurrected out of my body. Uh, it's one thing to realize you've got a sliver it's another thing to ask someone to take it out. You know why? You think it's painless? Some of them are. Some of them, are, they look, oh, there's... And there are other ones that are sitting there, and can't you get that thing out yet? Get a drill, get something. Just get that thing out of there. When God breaks us, He is going to take away everything out of our lives that is keeping us from Him. And when he breaks us, if we've got this big castle we're building, oh, look at this home I've got, look at this life I've got, just like with Job, they can all come crumbling down, coming crumbling down pretty quick. When God wants to break us, he takes health, or he can take a job, or your job security, or your family, or your bank account. Whatever it is you've put your faith and your trust into besides God, he is going to break you from that. Everything is going to be gone. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. Let 
Just give me a moment. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of our life. When God starts to work on you, He's going to give you your own Gethsemane like Jesus had. Gethsemane means pressing down, squeezing out. When, uh, when you had uh, your olives and you're working your olives to get the oil out, you used a very heavy stone, a big round stone, and you had this little track that the stone would go in and you had a donkey that would pull that stone around and it would crush all of the olives to get the oil out. And it would take a while. And you can, when you, if you see that, you hear this crackling take place of all of the olives as it's squeezing out. And brethren, in our lives, when God wants us to suffer, and there's a reason why he calls us to suffer, he will take out of our hearts and our lives everything that he sees that keeps us from him. You know how I know that? What happened with Abraham and Isaac? Abraham was looking at Isaac at this wonderful son, and God says, if I can paraphrase, I want you to give your son to me. I want you to offer him up for a burnt offering. What was God asking Abraham to do? There's something in your life. I want it out of there because that's my place and that's your son. You know that we can love our wives, or our wives can love their husbands so much they can put them on a higher plane than God or our children. And this is what Abraham had to face. When God calls us to suffer, first of all, number one, he breaks us. Number two, he empties us of ourselves. Let's go to verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not, what does it say? Trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. So in the first one, Paul, verse 8, is talking about we were given the sentence of death. He's not talking about a happy time. He's talking about suffering. And then, number verse 9, he says, why did this happen? Because God wanted to teach us we cannot rely on ourselves. We need to rely totally on Him. And you know what the problem is? What happens sometimes when we're going through trouble, we try to find someone real quickly to rescue us. And there are times when God does not want us to be rescued. He wants us to go through a time of suffering. Why? If you take uh, silver, uh, at least in the old uh, Roman times, how they made silver to be perfect is you had this man who had had for this container and he would heat the silver up. And after it got to a certain degree, the infirmities or the bad things that were in the silver came up to the top and they would skim it off. And then they would cool it off and then they'd heat it up about seven times until the silver you got was perfect silver. Sometimes God calls us to suffering those heated times to get those things to come to the surface that God can take out of our lives. Now, why did Jesus have to suffer? He had no sin. We read in another scripture that God called Jesus to suffering for the perfection of his life. And yet he was already perfect. See, he empties. In this step, we can see those things that God is saying, this cannot be in your life anymore. We've got to take it away. And when we get to that point in our heart and our life, we're going to do one of two things. We either reject God or we give up what He wants. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, nowhere but God. That's what happens in this instance. You, you can't. I, and you and I have gone through different troubles in our lives. Mine different from yours, of course. But there are times you were looking and wanting someone to give you that physical uh, help and compassion. Job couldn't get that in his friends or in his wife. And I think it's because God wanted Job to be at a certain place where it was just Job and God alone. And we find that in verse, at chapter 42. Chapter 41 and all that area where God speaks to Job and Job realizes he wanted to be close to God but he had to go through a lot of suffering first to get to that, that impact that he was looking for. And then point number three. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to verse 10. 
Now this is God restores. God restores. First of all, we see that they had the sentence of death upon him. Then Paul talks about uh, learning that he could not trust in himself or in others. And then number three, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver. And that is an active verb. He is always delivering us in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So what is the point? When God wants to take us through a time of growth, which is a time of suffering, we have to realize that there's a the death sentence upon us or, or taking of things that are so close to our hearts that it breaks us. Then he wants to empty us of what is there. And then finally, he restores us, just like Abraham. Remember what happened with Abraham? He raised his hand to kill his son. And then God says, okay, stop. And God had perfect time with that. When, Because when Abraham raised it up, that knife, he had everything on the altar. Not only his son, but his own heart was on the altar too. And then when God saw that, he said, it's enough. And then what happened after that? God blessed him abundantly. The three Hebrew uh, that went through the fire. We take a look at that. They went into the fire and they came out and it says after they got out of the fire and, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar realized that God was in those three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says then they were elevated in their position in uh, his kingdom. They did not receive that until after they went through the fire. Do you think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had some questions when they were walking towards the fiery furnace? I like what one of them said, we are not careful to answer you, Nebuchadnezzar, because either God's going to deliver us or we're going to die. They had no question they were going to go. The same with, uh, if we looked at Daniel going to the lion's den. He was going to keep praying and this was his place of fire. You want to go in while the lions are and they're hungry? And you're going down into this cave or whatever it was he went into? But God delivered him too. Brethren, there are times we go through a fire and God shows us he can deliver us out of the fire. So God restores. What about the years of David? Running away from Saul. But God, you told me I'm anointed king. Samuel said so. So I'm, what am I doing out here? Why am I running away from, from Saul? Why have I lost my wife? Everything I've got is gone. I have nothing but the shirt on my back. And yet God was teaching David through all those times what kind of a king he was going to need to be. Trusting in God totally. <clears throat> we are called to suffer. Anyone who believes they can live a life without going through that time doesn't know their God. Why? For the bottom reason that I find here is he wants us to grow in him, to have a deeper relationship, to trust in him totally. And those are those times of suffering, to help us to grow. Uh, I'm going to end with three scriptures here, found in Revelation 2. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes... I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of paradise of God. Overcomes what? A time of suffering, times of trials, times of temptations. If we overcome and we go through those times of suffering, there is a reward for us. Am I correct on that? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, we've got that word again. I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. Do you know that you can't get that until you get through this time of suffering? This time of growth? And why do we have to suffer? Because of our sinful condition. Because we're always the ones who want to go back on things. And in order for us to grow and to be right in God's sight, to be that child that we want to be, God has to put us through a fire every once in a while. Finally, and he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. I like that word overcomes. That means we've got some hard times to go through. 
We've got some hearts. But you know what? God loves us so much. We read that for every son that God loves, he chastens. Just like we do. We're looking at a, a couple here that have three children. And they have to get after their kids every once in a while. Why? Because they love them. They want them to be the best that they can be. The same with all of us with our kids. We're not just going to let our kids go so that uh, they'll make mistakes and end up in welfare or something else someday. We want them to be the best they can be. And sometimes it's those hard lessons that are the toughest ones, but they're done in love. And that's what God does with us. Father in heaven, thank you for revealing to us your love for us through the sacrifice Jesus was going to make on Calvary for us. To suffer not for his own sin, for he had no sin, but for our sin. He was willing to pay that price. He was willing to walk that road, that hard road. He knew what was coming. It wasn't like he was uh, mistaken about what was going to take place. He knew that that road meant a hard time at the end. But he still did it because he loved us. And Lord, you call us to suffering. When people can make fun of us for what we believe, or we could lose a job because of what we believe. Or there are people all around this world who are in jails because of what they believe or even giving their lives for what they believe. Help us, Lord, to have faith and trust in you, knowing that whatever problems come our way, your grace is sufficient for us. You're able to give us the strength to help us through those times so that our lives can glorify you. So, Lord, as we consider and we're coming to the Lord's Supper, help us to remember and be reminded that, Jesus, what you went through for us was a loving act of giving your life for us. We ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.